my name is uh, Stefano Pinna and uh, um, I'm the new out outreach for uh, three conservation districts, uh, Poultney Meadowee, Rockland and Bennington County. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the basics of uh, growing hemp and also a little bit about the RAPs which are the required agricultural practices. Um, the schedule is a little tight. Uh, so I suggest that if you have questions about my presentation, you can ask me later or you can wait for the farmers because uh, they probably are going to have uh, great answers for you. Um, I just want to uh, give you a little bit of, of my background. Um, so I come uh, from Italy and uh, I studied there for, uh, um, in college, agriculture sciences for five years. And uh, during my last year of college, uh, I started to get interested in hemp. And so I decided to move to Central Italy, where there was a research station that was uh, studying hemp for uh, grain and fiber production. So today, I'm not going to spend much time on uh, uh, fiber and grain production, but mostly on CBD production, because I guess that most of the interest is in there. So I was just wondering how many of you are planning to grow hemp for fiber or oil? Okay. So yeah, if you have questions, we can, we can talk about those later. So here are just some numbers. Um, just to show the increase in uh, acreage in the past three years. Um, to, so the, the acreage increased almost by 10 times. Um, and uh, in 2019, probably these numbers are going to be way different uh, because of the new farm bill that um, reclassifies hemp as a commodity crop under USDA. So before I get into the details of hemp cultivation, I just wanted to clarify the difference uh, between hemp and marijuana. Uh, to make this easy, uh, I always like to compare um, hemp and uh, marijuana to sweet corn and field corn. So as you all know, these, these two uh, plants are pretty much the same. The only thing that changes is uh, the sugar content. And uh, we can say a similar thing about uh, hemp and marijuana, but here the difference is not in the sugar, obviously, but in the type and amount of uh, cannabinoids that are produced by the plant. And uh, when we want to legally define hemp, we just focus on one of those hundreds of cannabinoids, uh, which is THC. And THC is the chemical that um, makes you feel high when you smoke it or ingest it to a high, high percentage, like 10% or more in the flower. Um, so if you want to grow hemp legally in Vermont, uh, the concentration of CBD in the flower has to be under 0.3%. Um, if you go over 1%, uh, the, um, your crop has to be destroyed. And uh, if you stay within 0.3% and 1%, you can, you can have some corrective action to, by the processor to save, save your, your product. So this plant can, uh, can grow really tall. It can go up to 12 feet. Um, it is a dioic plant, and that means that we have male plants and female plants. And obviously, we can distinguish uh, those plants by the flower. Um, and it's really important, especially for the production of CBD. Um, male, male flowers look like, uh, like clusters of grapes, kind of. And female can be distinguished because of these uh, uh, kind of translucent hairs um, that grow always on the top of the plants and also at the connection of the branch with the stem. So for CBD production, um, you don't you want to avoid the males. So all the effort is to remove those plants. Um, for uh, uh, oil and fiber, uh, you don't need to uh, eliminate, elim eliminate the males. Um, and actually, for fiber, males are, are better than females' plants because they give a more finer, finer fiber. Um, so we have uh, so many different uh, applications for hemp. 
the important thing to know is that um, for each of so, uh, your end use determines how to crop. And so uh, we're going to have different um, type of cropping techniques depending on the, the um, Hillary? <laughs> depending on uh, the type of product that we want to get. So as you can see, uh, if you grow hemp for fiber, you want a, a really dense uh, stem of plants. Uh, the plants need to be more or less uh, thin as a pencil, and this because you want a really fine fibers. Um, if you grow it for seeds, the diameter of the stem is not so important. So you can save some seeds and give, give the plants more, more space. Uh, also, the plants are going to grow taller because they have more resources. And then for hemp, uh, for uh, production of flowers, of, of CBD, um, you want to give them even more space because uh, uh, you, wanna, um, you want that each plant can get as much light as possible. Um, so generally speaking, I would say that the production of hemp for CBD, it's more labor intensive. Um, it's associated with high cost usually, and it's, you, you grow it more like uh, an horticultural or orchard crop. Um, if you grow it instead for oil and fiber, um, generally you apply more crop cropping techniques and uh, uh, it requires less labor, um, less cost, but there's a slower interest in the market compared to CBD hemp, and so it might be useful to first find the processing uh, facility. So whatever uh, purpose you choose, the recommendation for seeding date and the seed depth are the same. Uh, for, uh, um, you want to make sure that the soil is around 50 degrees when you plant it, and uh, um, this might change ob obviously also depending on the type of soil. So you're going to have more challenge probably with clay soil because they tend to stay colder for a longer time. Uh, seed depth uh, um, varies between uh, half an inch and three quarter of an inch. Uh, this depends usually by the moisture content of your soil and also by the soil texture. So if you have a sandy soil, you can probably go down a little deeper. If you have a clay soil, I would suggest to stay uh, around 0 0.5 inch. So this plant, this plant um, grow pretty slowly at the beginning. So it's really important that you avoid stresses uh, also because there's no chemicals that are allowed on hemp so far, and so a good establishment is, is fundamental. Um, if, you, if the plant um, is st stressed or uh, if it stays too wet for too long at the beginning of uh, the growing season, you're going to end up with a lot of weeds and uh, a poor crop. So in case uh, you have a forecast that um, for heavy rain, I would suggest always to plant it after the rain and not before. So here are the seeding recommendations. So as you can see, uh, for CBD production, we talk of plants per acre. And for grain and fiber, we talk about plant per square foot. Um, so for CBD production, there's a number of combination of uh, density that you can use. Uh, the mostly used probably are 5x5 five five or 6x6, six six. so it means that um, between uh, plants that are in different rows you have 5 feet and in the same row you have other 5 feet. Uh, you can go down to 1x1, one one, uh, but that depends all by um, your, your, your system. Uh, for grain and fiber, um, there are different numbers in terms of rate. Um, so the factors to keep in mind when you choose your rate obviously are germinability of those seeds, uh, weeds in your field. If uh, there are lots of weeds, you probably want to stay a little higher with the rates. 
and also the weight of a thousand seeds. So, because each variety has different density. Um, also, consider always that there's a 20 to 30 percent of mortality in the stem. Um, nutrient recommendation. Um, these are just. This is just a guide. So, I always suggest to take a soil test before you start a crop, because um, obviously you're going to have. Uh, uh, different nutrients in different fields. So generally speaking, uh, this crop uh, requires a lot of nitrogen uh, and not much potassium at all. Um, phosphorus is medium. Um, so the, for grain and fiber, obviously you want a little bit more nitrogen because you have more biomass per acre. Uh, consider also that for fiber, if you produce it for fiber, a lot of nutrients are going to be recycled back in the soil because uh, um, you need to leave uh, your, the plants on the ground for two weeks so that the fiber uh, can separate more easily from, uh, from the woody core. So uh, talking about CBD production, uh, these are the different options. Uh, regular seeds are the cheapest option, obviously. Uh, but requires more labor because uh, potentially uh, there's 50% of males and 50% of females in those seeds. And uh, uh, since you don't harvest the males, if you don't sex them in time, you're going to end up with the, with the yield that is half of what you were uh, anticipating. Uh, because, uh, and you're going to waste a lot of resources in fertilizer or water. So a trick that you can do for this, uh, if you have a greenhouse, is uh, to switch the, the numbers of our, of light uh, close to 12 or 13. And in this way, you force the plant to go to flower. And at that point, even if the plants are small, they're gonna produce flowers and you can just simply remove the males. Um, the, other, the other option are feminized seeds. Um, those are uh, theoretically 90 to 99 percent females, and these numbers depend obviously on uh, the genetics. Uh, more stable genetics have more uh, uh, female plants, and also by the stresses. So if there's a stress, the plant is going to uh, tend to produce also male flowers to survive. And the last option are clones. Uh, clones are more expensive but uh, they're a great cho choice uh, if you don't have a greenhouse or if you don't, if you don't want to deal too much with the seeds. Um, the, great things about, the great thing about uh, clones is that they're all the same because they all come from the same mother. Uh, the downside is that uh, clones are not deeply rooted, rooted uh, compared to uh, regular plants coming from regular seeds uh, where the plants produce a really deep, deep root. Um, so. so these are just some pictures. Uh, on the bottom left, you have a, a transplanter. That's, that's a great machine, probably costs a lot of money. But if you have them, it can save you a lot of work. So these are the factors to keep in mind when you plan your, your, your crop. Um, Spacing is probably the most important factor. Um, you need, uh, you're gonna need, uh, you're gonna have to spend a lot of time during uh, late season, especially during flowering, uh, to remove the males. So if you, have, if you have a spacing that allows you to go in between the plants, that's a plus. Uh, also, uh, your harvest meta method, it depends also by your density. Um, Plastic cover uh, it saves you a lot of time in weeding, um, but it warm, warms up the soil a lot, so you might want to consider some irrigation system. Um, also, plastic cover um, kind of protects the plants from splashing, um, and that's, that's really important because if you have a heavy rain, the lower buds close, closer to the soil are going to get splashed with dirt, and you might lose some product. So even if you don't use plastic cover, 
maybe cardboard or hay or something can, can give you some advantage. Uh, irrigation system, um, for what I've seen so far, 90% of the farms that grow hemp ha have an irrigation system. Um, drip irrigation is the most used, um, and you're gonna, um, the plus of having an irrigation system is that you can uh, source water, you can give water during flowering, which is the most uh, um, important phase of the production. So flowering happens uh, uh, when the, the hours of light get closer to 12 or 13 per day. Um, the flowering state, the length of the flowering depends totally by the, the, the variety. And uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, biomass that is produced during these stages, um, close to 25% of the total uh, biomass. And so it's important to give uh, nutrients and water during this, this part of the cycle. Uh, you have also to keep in mind that the flowering starts from the top and goes toward the, towards the bottom. Uh, that the top uh, buds are going to have higher percentage of CBD. And uh, the production of CBD increases over time. Um, a good question maybe for the farmers later is when they harvest their, their hemp because it's true that CBD production increases over time, but also THC. So that finding a sweet spot where you can maximize your CBD content and keep low the THC, it's, uh, it's critical. Um, these are just some, some fields, uh, beautiful buds. Um, and these are the, hop, the option for the harvest. So the first option is to harvest the whole plant by hand. And by doing this, you're gonna have probably the top quality product uh, with a percentage of CBD between 12 and 20. Um, this method is good for small acreage because it requires a lot of people. Um, the second option is to harvest uh, the top of the plant by hand, and in this case you're going to have a product that is high quality. And then after two or three weeks, uh, you're going to chop the whole plant and uh, um, have a lower CBD product, but still, um, it, it's still good. Uh, the third option is to chop the whole plant, and this is going to give you uh, a lower quality product, but it requires obviously less labor. Uh, it requires more space for drying, um, but it's a, it's a, it's also a good method. Um, By chopping the mechanically in harvest. Yeah. So these uh, uh, for harvesting. Uh, I'm not going to talk uh, about this because uh, every producer has a different method. So there's not like a universal uh, technique. Uh, it's still new and so each producer is still trying to figure out the best way uh, to do it. Um, generally speaking, uh, humidity has to be under 12% to avoid mold issues. And uh, you're going to need some equipment like fans, uh, dehumidifiers, um, dark space uh, but, uh, would be better. And keep the temperature down to 60 and 50 to 60 percent of humidity. Um, the last thing is crop rotation. So I, know when, I don't want to bring you bad luck, but uh, probably if you uh, grow the hemp on the same piece of land for a number of years, you're gonna be likely to have uh, uh, mold uh, and insect problems uh, after, I don't know, three to four years, it depends obviously by your field. So a good, a good practice would be to put in rotation those fields to avoid some of these problems. So the last part of my presentation is about hemp and the REP. Uh, which are the practices that each farm is required to follow in order to uh, limit the impact on water quality. Uh, this, depending on the size of the operation, we can uh, uh, distinguish between two farms. Uh, small farm, if you produce hemp 
on less than uh, on more than four acres, or you uh, produce an income from the sales of hemp uh, of more than two thousand dollars. And uh, in that case, the specific requirements for your farm uh, are to um, sample your fields every five years and keep track of your of your application. Uh, whether it is manure or uh, fertilizer, it's important to keep date, uh, the date where you spread it, the field where you spread it, the rate, and the type of uh, uh, nutrients that you apply. Um, in case you grow more than 50 acres of hemp, uh, you're going to need to certify your farm. Uh, it's, it's really an easy process, and you're going to become a small certified farm. Uh, in that case, the requirements are a little bit more. Uh, you need to, um, to attend water quality trainings um, and at least four hours of those every five years. Um, for those of you that need those credits, there's uh, an application at the table that you can fill out and it's going to give you half a credit for today's workshop. Um, then you need to have a nutrient management plan which is a tool that allows you to allocate nutrients field by field, uh, depending by uh, the, character the characteristic of your soil. Uh, you're going to need to soil test um, every three years and be inspected at least once every seven years. So the goal of the REPs is uh, um, the goal of the REPs is to keep your nutrients in your soil, not only because you're going to um, prevent some environmental problems, but also because you're going to save some money, obviously, in fertilizer if you keep your, your nutrients there. Um, also, if you keep a healthy soil, uh, probably you're going to have better, better yields. Um, so the... First topic and most important one probably is manure application. Um, manure application uh, uh, have, should not be done when uh, uh, there are high chances of losing nutrients from your field. So when there's snow or uh, fields are flooded or there are high chances of runoff, it's not recommended. Um, also, uh, fields that are kind of steep need, need more attention. Um, in case you have a field that, is, uh, that has more than 10% slope on average, and at the bottom of the slope there's a surface water that can be a stream or a pond or a river, you are required to um, put a vegetative buffer uh, that is at least uh, 100 feet. And then... Uh, um, as you probably know, you cannot spread manure between uh, December 15 and April 1st, and also on frozen ground or exposed, uh, exposed bedrock. Uh, the last thing is that manure should not be uh, applied within 100 feet from uh, private water supplies and 200 feet from uh, public water supplies. Um, so flooded fields, flooded fields are uh, another beast, and uh, I wouldn't recommend to plant hemp on a flooded field because obviously the plants suffer in the, the beginning of the of uh, the growth. Um, but if you have a flooded field and you're planning to to grow hemp and spread manure, uh, that manure needs to be injected or incorporated within 48 hours. Um, also, if that field is uh, subject to uh, frequent flooding, you are required to uh, have a cover crop that needs to be planted uh, before October 1st if it's broadcasted, or October 15 if it's uh, uh, drill seeded. So, if you don't know if your soils are cons considered frequently flooded by the agency, or if you want to have more information of, on the characteristic of your soil, this is a great tool. It's the Vermont uh, uh, A&R Atlas. There's a lot of information that you can find, and I suggest to use it. Um, so in case uh, um, you grow hemp on a, 
play soil or if your only option is to grow it on flooded soil, you might consider to use tile drainage. And uh, there has been some uh, updates in the legislation for tile drainage. And so all the tiles that are going to be installed uh, uh, this year need to have a rodent guard. And um, also, um, if, if uh, you install a tile drain uh, that it's uh, uh, close to um, a vegetative treatment area, uh, you should stay at least 200 feet from the edge of that uh, treatment area. Um, also, if you have a nutrient management plan and uh, you have more than 20 parts per million of phosphorus, um, you have to apply nutrients of less than uh, uh, phosphorus crop removal, even if uh, your plan is potentially uh, can be managed on, on nitrogen. Um, yeah. uh, so the last things are buffers. Um, Buffers are, uh, uh, perennial, are zone of perennial vegetation and should be maintained, obviously, uh, if you have a hemp field uh, close to a ditch or surface water. Um, in this case, uh, you are required to have a buffer and uh, buffers need to be at least 25 feet for a uh, uh, field that are close to surface water and 10 feet uh, uh, if, they are, if they have a, a ditch uh, adjacent to the field. Uh, also, surface inlet from uh, 2018 probably they're no longer uh, cannot no longer be installed. Uh, but if you have one of them, I suggest to uh, report it to the agency and to keep uh, 25 feet of uh, of uh, buffer around it. Uh, so you can uh, you're allowed to harvest your buffer, so you can get some extra yields of hay, uh, for example. Um, you cannot apply manure, um, but you can apply fertilizer or, or compost for the establishment and the maintenance of, of the buffer. Um, and also tillage is, is not allowed unless you have to renew the buffer or if you have to, to establish it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.